Chapter 4 The Call Dawned in his short-sleeved, olive-drab uniform, Chris stood among his colleagues, awaiting the commencement of the morning muster. However, his focus wasn't fixed on the imminent task, but rather on thoughts of his family, nestled back in Pennsylvania. The passage of six years since his last assignment at the Tucson Border Patrol Station had been marked by time and distance, but now, owing to a tide of political unrest, his department was facing an unprecedented onslaught from a new administration. The once steadfast support for the Jackson administration, which had characterized Chris's colleagues' social media accounts, had become a liability under the Howard administration's reign. Swiftly and without reservation, those with such affiliations were severed from their duties, leaving the crucial Southwest region perilously understaffed. This cascade of events prompted a hurried reallocation of personnel from the northern border, where Chris had been stationed for a number of years. These developments were quite contrary to the plans he had harbored of concluding his career with this final assignment before stepping into retirement. In 2003, Chris stepped up to the call that beckoned him to become a Border Patrol agent. He was then residing in Phoenix, Arizona. Without hesitation, he reached out to his wife, Michelle, informing her of his decision. Accepting an offered position in Tucson, he found himself once again in a familiar place. As soon as he confirmed his acceptance, the gear shifted rapidly. It was now up to Michelle to locate a suitable residence in Tucson and orchestrate the relocation of their belongings, all while Chris embarked on an arduous six-month border patrol academy situated in Charleston, South Carolina. Despite the formidable challenges that the academy presented, the passage of years has not dulled his memory of those days. Every now and then, Chris finds himself involuntarily echoing the resounding chant of his academy class. We protect the red, white, and blue. We're the mighty 572. With thoughts of his academy days, he could even hear one of his old instructors, BPA Cox, calling out his name once again. Shaw, Shaw, you going to answer me, Nugget? Cox asked as new journeyman agents snickered at a senior agent being addressed as Nugget, a term reserved for probationary agents or trainees. Nugget? Nobody's called me that since the Academy. Suddenly Chris realized it was not just his imagination. It really was Cox's voice. Before he could respond to present-day watch Commander Cox, almost as reflex he brought order back to the muster room with a commanding, As you were. Instantly the snickering ended. Supervisory Agent Chris Shaw, I figured you would still be with the agency after all these years. Though would think you might remember your own name when it's called. Cox stated in a tone that was partly sarcastic and serious. Here, sir, Chris called out, realizing that morning roll call was taking place and that his old academy instructor was now a watch commander at Tucson Station. Normally, such a distraction during morning muster would have never happened, but these were not normal times. It was his first day back at Tucson Station, and homesickness had already taken hold as his desire to be with Michelle and their two sons grew by the minute. I should have posted more shit about Howard online, Chris mumbled lightly. Say that again? Cox asked, stopping everything causing everyone to focus on Chris. Deflecting, Chris asked, Is this everyone, sir? We barely have half the regular staff. Yes, with all the cuts and reorganizing we are going to be short-staffed for some time. But we will manage. Cox stated as if he had already prepared for that question. While a prevailing sense of pride enveloped most individuals in the room due to their roles as agents, it was evident that, much like himself, not everyone was content with the prevailing state of affairs. The reign of the Howard administration had cast a wide net of influence, sparing not even the chief patrol agent in Washington from its effects. Merely expressing agreement with the previous administration's stance on national border security in front of a camera had swiftly resulted in the replacement of the CPA. Chris pondered whether it was the pangs of homesickness or a culmination of factors that led to his own dissatisfaction, prompting him to utter, Don't you mean purge? The room grew quiet, the weight of Cox's gaze fixed upon him. Drawing from his experiences back at the academy, he was acutely aware of Cox's unwavering commitment to duty and the stringent decorum expected. The words he had spoken hung in the air, irreversible now, and he felt no inclination to retract them, even if he could. 
Chris maintained his steady gaze, prepared for the inevitable verbal reprimand that he sensed was about to follow from Cox. That is a fair assessment, Shaw. Cox replied, holding Chris's gaze for a few seconds longer than normal, as if in deep thought. Near the front rows where the few new Border Patrol trainees were assigned to sit, they did so with perfectly pressed uniforms and posture seemingly straightened up, even more sensing unease in the room. Chris maintained a relaxed posture in his seat at the back of the room, surrounded by other agents whom also possessed years of seniority. Anticipating a stern reprimand, he had mentally braced himself for a verbal dressing down. To his astonishment, the expected rebuke never came, prompting a subtle yet noticeable nod from Chris as he processed the unexpected turn of events. Cox continued with the briefing knowing information he was about to pass on was going to cause a bigger reaction from senior staff. Listen, I'm not going to bullshit you. Times are hard, but as Border Patrol agents we will get through this. There are always changes that come with new administrations, and though this one has been more extreme than others, we will do our duty and hold the line. I do caution you not to post anything on social media that may be construed as negative toward the Howard administration. We have lost too many agents already, now to other changes taking place. And buckle up, because it's a big adjustment. Cox paused and looked around the briefing room. We will no longer be patrolling much of our original area of responsibility, namely the border miles from Nogales area westward toward Aravaca. Instead, our new AOR runs 25 miles west into Casa Grande's AOR. CAG is getting shifted west as well to assist Ajo. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, there are maps up front with GPS coordinates of the major landmarks. His suspicion was correct, and the grumbling began immediately. Sir, there is no way. We getting new agents soon? How? Then Chris stood up speaking loud enough to drown out the others. Sir, we should get to it then. Will that be all? Knowing from almost two decades working for the government, there was no point in arguing when given new guidelines. These changes just must be carried out till somebody higher up decides it was a bad idea, and Cox already knew they were without everyone in the room complaining. He had gotten away with enough lip in this muster, and as a supervisor, it was time to knuckle down and toe the line. Just one last thing. Apparently the fugitives from the Squires Farm Massacre are not heading this way after all. In case you haven't been watching the news, they are with a rogue guard unit held up at an armory in Jefferson City, Missouri. So, you can disregard the bolo for them along our now-extended patrol. That's all for now. Cox normally would have waited and taken questions before dismissing, but after presenting the new information, he thought better of it at this time. SBPA Shaw, an incredibly young trainee announced as he approached. Looking up from where he had remained seated with other senior agents after conclusion of morning muster, Chris stood before replying, reading his name tag. What is it, Agent Barnes? As most new trainees come straight from the academy, Barnes nervously spoke, Sir, I will be riding along with you today. Any advice to, to properly begin the day, sir? Looking the kid over, Chris normally enjoyed giving new recruits the same hard time he received when first coming to the station. Only now all it did is remind him that he was back in Tucson, away from his family a few thousand miles away. Barnes, grab your tricky bag, your camelback, and check out a long arm and whatever else you need. He tossed him a set of keys to a marked Tahoe. Make sure she's gassed up and throw a case of water in the back. I'll meet you at the ice machine in fifteen minutes. Yes, sir, Barnes eagerly replied before looking down at his watch, then almost sprinting away. Chris let out a slight laugh, knowing there wasn't a chance Barnes was going to quickly check out a M4 rifle and other sensitive items from their station armory, then make it to the ice machine in fifteen minutes. Have to at least make things a little interesting while I'm here, Chris thought. He had already loaded his gear, so at least he spared the kid that much. After a quick stop to fill his own camelback with ice and water, he waited at the curb for Barnes's untimely arrival. Time stretched on in silence, minutes feeling like hours, as Chris's mind inevitably drifted back to his family. The ache of homesickness he felt now was unlike anything he had ever experienced. The situation was profoundly different from any of his past separations, 
like the six months of academy training when he first joined the patrol. Back then, it was just him and Michelle, and they had a clear understanding of how long they would be apart. Chris shook his head, trying to dispel the vivid memories of Michelle's smile and the laughter of their two young sons. He turned his gaze to the horizon, searching for anything to divert his attention from the relentless thoughts of his family. The uncertainty of when he would be reunited with them weighed heavily on his heart, casting a shadow over his thoughts like a persistent cloud. Wait, what? Looking down at his watch, eight minutes had passed since giving Barnes instructions, yet there was his Tahoe pulling smartly to the curb. Quickly, Chris pulled his phone from a cargo pocket, clicked on Contact Michelle, and typed, Love and miss you, pressing send button just as Barnes opened the car door. That took some doing, but made it with a minute to spare. Pop the back, sir, Barnes asked, setting his tricky bag on the passenger side floor, where it could be easily obtained, then walking to the rear with jugs of water and a large bag of gear. Clicking a button for their vehicle's back hatch, Chris quickly realized with less than half regular staff, Barnes had little trouble. Once everything was loaded, Chris took control of the vehicle and began their long drive. Is this your first day, Barnes? Chris asked not only curious about his new partner, but seeking anything to redirect his thoughts as his pocket vibrated, alerting him of a text message that he knew would be Michelle. No, I've been on the job for about a month. How long have you been with Border Patrol? Barnes inquired as they pulled out from the station parking garage. Just over 16 years. Most of it at this station before transferring to Airy Station and moving my family to Pennsylvania. Who was your journeyman before I arrived? Chris asked while looking around at how much things had changed in Tucson since last on duty here. Matias, where have we been assigned today? With the added miles of border, it sounds like a great deal of road time. Barnes stated then asked his own question. Drawing on years of experience in reading people, Chris detected a subtle flicker of discomfort in Barnes the moment the question left his lips. It was a fleeting expression, but one that didn't escape Chris's keen observation. Moreover, Chris couldn't help but notice how swiftly Barnes deflected, smoothly transitioning the conversation to an entirely different topic. Matthias. Didn't see that name on the duty roster this morning. He out sick? No, they didn't really say, but he was let go. Not sure why. This time, as Barnes responded, a distinct aroma of something fishy seemed to waft through the air, catching Chris's attention. Yet he was cautious not to push the issue too hard, aware that appearances could sometimes be deceiving. Suppressing his instincts that whispered that things might not be as straightforward as they appeared, Chris offered an answer, allowing the conversation to flow. My old route with a few extra miles added. We're patrolling area between Sasabe and Aravaca. I'm assuming there still isn't much local law enforcement presence, so we're going to check up on some ranchers I used to know there. Ranchers? Those people aren't going to talk to you about anything. They're too scared of drug smugglers and pretty much just scream at any agent that sets foot on their land, Barnes stated. Chris contemplated the words of his new partner, letting their significance sink in. As he did, memories flooded back of the last time he had patrolled that area, years stretching between then and now. When I was here last, those outside of town liked Border Patrol, long as you didn't destroy their fences or disrupt their ranching. What's changed? Well, Howard Felt and his administration are working towards saving endangered species, such as Mexican gray wolf, jaguar, and ocelot that are barely hanging on. Many of these ranchers have had their fencing removed to prevent harm to these animals, and in some cases federal land leases revoked. It should improve the habitat for these animals and many more. Barnes joyfully stated, What the hell has been happening here? Does this guy think it is a good thing lives are being destroyed? Chris thought, but chose to stay away from the politics behind those decisions he didn't agree with. Instead asked, El taco pollo loco está quieto en la ciudad? Confused by what was said, Barnes replied, I caught taco out of that. Sorry, my Spanish is very limited. Alarms started to go off all over in Chris's mind, as he quickly found a place to pull over to the side of the road miles outside of the city. I asked you, is the Polo Loco taco stand is still outside of town? An easy question. 
So what's going on with your Espinal? It's part of your job, and I've seen guys fired swiftly after failing to learn and speak Spanish. And while we're at it, what's the real story on Matias? Obviously, in some state of panic, Barnes stared out the windshield for a few seconds before replying, Matias was deemed to be a threat to our current administration. A threat? How? Did he post a meme they didn't like? Chris retorted with a wry grin, an attempt to break the tension that had settled like a fog. However, Barnes's demeanor turned serious, his eyes narrowing in a profound sincerity. He turned toward Chris, a stern expression etched across his face, ready to share a reality that went beyond any sarcastic remark. No. After my evolution and extensive conversations with Matias during our patrols, Barnes stated, his voice carrying an almost weary depth, and furthermore, I have no need to speak Spanish, Mr. Shaw, because my job is to evaluate personnel within the government to ensure they do not pose a threat and their values mirror that of our administration. The gravity of his words was palpable, like a revelation that left an echo in the air. Chris's mind raced to make sense of it all, a maelstrom of thoughts swirling through his consciousness. The notion Barnes was suggesting seemed to resonate eerily with some distant historical echoes, Images of party observers that Communist China had infiltrated throughout their government came to mind. Taken aback by the enormity of what he had just heard, Chris felt his grip on the wheel tighten. The echoes of Barnes's words seemed to reverberate with a sense of systemic control that chilled his thoughts. And then, in a fraction of a second, something shifted. A barely perceptible grin appeared on Barnes's face. It was the faintest curve of his lips, but Chris caught it, and its implications weren't lost on them. In that charged moment, Chris knew he needed to take action. With a decisive movement, Chris shifted the vehicle into drive and pressed hard on the accelerator. The tire screeched slightly, and they were on their way, the road leading back to Tucson Station. The journey ahead was veiled in uncertainty, the implications of Barnes's words mingling with the sense of urgency that now hung over them.